and the, they killed their mother. And then they spent a couple of hours fabricating parts of the crime scene. I, I believe you, did you say, yes, sir. me? Actually, I did you say that? Yes, sir. Myself, I know the truth. I did not have anything to do with the abduction of my children. Ms. Lovejoy had gone to the Carlsbad Police Department and made a complaint stating that Mr. Mulvihill had sexually assaulted her. And this is why I say my kids knew better because I've always told them everything that happened to me. Number 20, Diana Lovejoy. Diana Lovejoy's journey through the criminal justice system captivated the public's attention due to her dramatic reaction upon receiving a life sentence. The unfolding events took place in Carlsbad, San Diego, where she was arrested for her involvement in a sinister plot to slay her estranged husband, Greg Mulville. Gritton alleges McDavid had his rifle cocked and ready to fire before Greg and his friends spotted him. You can discharge a firearm and there'd be no reason for you to call the police and tell them afterwards? The shooter insists he's such a good shot that if he wanted the ex-husband dead, he'd be dead now. He had to go through numerous psychological evaluations. He had to see psychiatrists, psychologists. Ms. Lovejoy had gone to the Carlsbad Police Department and made a complaint stating that Mr. Mulvihill had simply assaulted her. And they ended up determining that actually he was the, the better parent of the two. About the time I realized what I was looking at, um, it felt like I had been hit in the back. Their tumultuous divorce battle had reached a boiling point leading Diana and her accomplice, Weldon McDavid Jr., to conspire against Greg's life. Throughout the trial, emotions ran high as the courtroom began a battleground of intense legal proceedings. The tension climaxed when the verdict was read, and Diana's reaction left everyone in astonishment. Overwhelmed by the weight of the sentence, she collapsed, fainting right there in the courtroom. Paramedics promptly rushed to her aid, and she was carefully carried away on a stretcher. Diana's extreme response vividly portrayed the inner turmoil and emotional tumult she experienced at that defining moment. The profound gravity of the situation, combined with the realization that she would spend the rest of her life behind bars, proved to be an overwhelming burden for her to bear. He was simply trying to help stop molestation of a three-year-old. The gunman, lying in the sniper position, shoots six to seven more rounds. The next thing I remember was starting to run. <laughs> she said that she suspected that Mr. Mulvihill was molesting her boy. The unanimous conclusion was that he, this was made up, that he had not molested his little boy. I fired six shots in the air, and once they started running, I ceased fire. Diana Lovejoy sets about looking for someone, and she finds that someone when she finds Mr. McDavid. Greens are taught if they wanted to kill someone, two to the center, max one to the head. I didn't call them because I knew that they would view that as me discharging a firearm. Number 19, Mitchell Blair. The case of Mitchell Blair is a deeply disturbing and tragic one that shook both the court and the community. Mitchell Blair, a mother of four children, shocked everyone when she took the lives of two of her own kids. We could see where Nikki's bare feet exited and re-entered uh, through that door in blood. That definitely did happen to me. That's why I know exactly how would have grew up. I, I don't believe anything they say. I, I, everything they said, whether it had some truth or fiction uh, in it. You get what I'm saying? So all I could do is go back and sit in my room and just sit there and look stupid. I'm a kid. I think I picked up a knife and I stabbed her. Where did you stab her? I think I stabbed her in the stomach. So do you believe that the, the violent person you went on to become is a, you were a product of your own childhood? Kind of like a joint effort. I try hard to get over that, but anybody who knows me, that touching the kids, the molesting, that no. The bodies of her one-year-old son named Stephen and her 13-year-old son named Stoney were tragically discovered in a freezer, causing immense grief and disbelief. During the court proceedings, Michelle Blair's behavior was erratic and alarming. She repeatedly freaked out, screaming and expressing her reasons for committing the heinous act. At some point in time, you did realize that morning your mom was dead. Yeah. She had so many strokes, and I'm telling you what my problem was always with you. Uh, when they were awakened to go to school for their, uh, by their mother, and I think that's what sparked the attack. She want to walk around like she big and bad all day. My mama, you, you, you big and bad. Everybody's scared of you. I'm cleaning it up and then they went to school so that they would have an alibi. And this is why I say my kids knew better because I've always told them 
everything that happened to me. And, and even to the point that they said in their writings um, that if they didn't get rid of her soon. You never talked to me about like this, but when I did come to you, you didn't do He interviewed that resident. Uh, he recalled uh, someone yelling. Blair claimed that her daughter had mistreated her other children, which she believed justified her actions. However, despite her assertions, no evidence was found to support her claims. The court proceedings were undoubtedly challenging due to Blair's disruptive behavior. Her outbursts and claims led to her being removed from the court multiple times as her behavior hindered the progress of the trial. It is important to note that the court system aims to ensure a fair and just trial, considering all available evidence and testimonies. In this case, the lack of evidence to support Blair's claims played a significant role in the court's decision. As a result of the horrifying crime she committed, can you talk me through the, the type of abuse that you had to suffer as a kid? You mean sexual abuse? So we would surmise that she was uh, pulled back into the house where the attack resumed. I told my mother what happened to me, and the only thing she said was, it's over with, so what the you want me to do about it? He heard someone ring his doorbell. He was in bed at the time, and he didn't get up to go investigate. Telling you what happened to me, you didn't do about it. And plus, I still had to see the person coming in and out my house. You're still friends with that person. I think I, I had her, her hands, I guess her feet. I mean, everybody have choices, so I can't just blame all that on my mom because I was still an adult. She was heavy. We just put it in. The water was turned on. Michelle Blair received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. This means that she will spend the rest of her life in prison, unable to seek release or have the opportunity for parole. I even tried to talk to my mom when I got in my mid-20s. She had strokes and things like that, and I'm like, Mom. By their account, they were up to 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. They didn't want to get up. I asked you to do something. The person lives around the corner on This particular time, it was just a woman named And they killed their mother. And then they spent a couple of hours fabricating parts of the crime scene. But when I come to you with some real and I tell you what happened to me, you didn't walk your around that corner and do to that woman. And they would write back and forth to each other how much they disliked their mother. I told them why, because I don't understand why it took me so long to tell my mom when I was a kid. This was an act of rage. It was the two girls had planned for this event. Number 18, Penelope Soto. Penelope Soto, a young woman from a wealthy background, found herself in a bond hearing, facing charges that had brought her before a judge. However, her behavior during the proceedings would leave a lasting impression on all those present in the courtroom. As the judge addressed Soto, explaining the purpose of the hearing and the seriousness of the charges against her, her demeanor seemed far from respectful. Instead of showing the appropriate decorum, she exhibited disrespectful behavior that shocked those in attendance. She audaciously laughed at the judge and even made derogatory remarks about his Cuban descent, revealing a callous disregard for- I don't believe this one or not. Do you understand that? Yes. And uh, do you understand that convicted felon? All right, I understand you, Andy, you work for pre-trial service? Yes. You're you the only- As your honor, we're gonna appoint us on the felony case as well, or we're not appointed on that. I'm appointing you for the contempt. Okay. You working? Yes. How much money are you making a week, approximately? Approximately about 200 bucks a week. Ill-advised, inconsiderate behavior at the time of the bond hearing. Go ahead. The car. Well, how, uh, how, how, how much you, would you say your jewelry is worth? Because of that, you could be found. You could even have contempt of court. As I told you before. OK, but it's, you know, well, kind you of, see, you know, we, are not in a, we are not in a club. Be serious about it. I'm serious about oh, it. You're difficult to maintain a job. Very difficult time. Understand that? Yes. Yes. Have you had any kind of drugs in the, in the last 24 hours? Actually, no. For the court and its authority. The judge, understandably infuriated by Soto's blatant disrespect, promptly called her back to the stand. With sternness in his voice and determination in his gaze. Respectfully, that the proper procedure had not taken place as far as the holding of Soto in contempt. Bye bye. Adios. Come on, will be 10,000. Are you serious? I am serious. Adios. Just the defendant herself would like to make a public apology to the court. 
Come back again. Come back again. <clears throat> I, <clears throat> yes, I understand completely, and I apologize. He doubled her bond, understanding that her behavior needed to be met with appropriate consequences. He sentenced her to 30 days in jail for contempt of court, emphasizing the severity of her actions. In the aftermath of the sentencing, Penelope Soto seemed to realize the gravity of her behavior. She offered a sincere apology, acknowledging the wrongfulness of her actions. Recognizing her remorse and perhaps wanting to provide an opportunity for personal growth, the judge showed leniency. He urged Soto to seek counseling, indicating his belief in the potential for rehabilitation and change. Soto, you have been charged with possession of Sanax and uh, B-A-R-S. I don't know what that is. What is Bar. that? Bar. Extremely disrespectful. Understand that? Yes. <laughs> it's not a joke, you know. We are not in, we are not in a club now. Explaining your behavior. Tell me, how do you feel? Well, my behavior was very no, irrational. No, no, no. Come back, ma'am. Come back. Come back. Give me the paper again. And. I apologize not only to the court and you, but to my family. I, I believe you. Did you say yes, sir. me? Actually, I did, did you say that? Yes, sir. Number 17, Kyandria Cook. Kyandria Cook's sentencing made waves across the internet, garnering viral attention due to her impassioned reaction. At the tender age of 18, Kyandria became entangled in an elaborate plot orchestrated through a dating app, which tragically culminated in the shooting of another teenager. Her actions resulted in a conviction for carjacking and she received a formidable sentence of 20 years. When the verdict was announced, Kyandria's mother unleashed a torrent of emotions she could no longer contain. The courtroom reverberated with her screams, cries, and intense distress, setting off a chain reaction that echoed through Kyandria herself. I did tell her there was a good chance she would be going home on the 27th, but uh, I never promised or guaranteed that she would. I'm not sure you've understood this, though, how serious this crime was. Uh, I consider it a miracle. 18-year-old Daytona Beach High School student who was sentenced to 20 years in prison for carjacking and battery. This young man is a lot. The other is um, that after it happened, he did it again. Has been allowed to withdraw her plea. The sentence was also thrown out. Get over. Overwhelmed by her mother's outburst and the staggering weight of her sentence, Kyandria crumbled under the weight of her own emotions, tears streaming down her face as she struggled to comprehend the gravity of her actions and the lifelong consequences that awaited her. The viral nature of Kyandria's reaction catapulted her case into the public eye, shining a spotlight on the emotional turmoil she endured throughout the sentencing process. Her breakdown encapsulated the indescribable internal struggle that arises when faced with the reality of irreversible actions and the weighty price one must pay. Keandra Cook pled no contest in June. Now a judge has agreed there was miscommunication between Cook and her former attorney. They're all going to run Keandria Cook's new attorneys had to prove a standard called manifest injustice to unravel her plea and sentence. We believe we were sure that she was coming home, that she was looking at community control and house arrest. Number 16, Tatiana Fuziari. Tatiana Fuziari is a woman who was convicted of slaying and child attack in the demise of her 10-month-old daughter, Mary Welch. Fuzari and her husband, Seth Welch, were both members of a religious group called the Sovereign Citizen Movement, which believes that the government has no authority over its citizens. This belief led the couple to refuse to seek medical help for Mary when she became ill. Mary was born on October 23, 2017. She was a healthy baby, and her parents were excited to welcome her into the world. However, when Mary was just 10 months old, she became ill. She had a fever, and she was vomiting and diarrhea. Well, you were just listening to parts of the 911 call made by the parents of a 10-month-old child after they found her dead in her crib. I don't even know. I don't, I think he left the room. I don't remember him being there anymore. I just... Cole, he's not breathing. I texted CPR earlier, he was unresponsive. I just remember doing the two little finger chest compression on her and then... 
I wiped her mouth. Father is already serving life in prison for the girl's death, and on Wednesday, her mother heard her fate in the Kent County courtroom. Pumping her chest with my fingers, and then I would breathe into her mouth, and then go back. Fuzari and Welch decided to treat Mary at home with natural remedies. They gave her herbs and essential oils, but Mary's condition did not improve. On August 2, 2018, Fazari called 911 and reported that Mary was lifeless. When police arrived at the scene, they found Mary's body. She was only eight pounds and she was covered in bruises. An autopsy revealed that Mary had passed away of malnutrition and dehydration. Fuzari and Welch were arrested and charged with slaying and child attack. They both pleaded not guilty, but they were found guilty at trial. Janice, Doug, this was a quick sentencing. We didn't hear much from the child's mother, Tatiana Fusari. To her chest and then back to her mouth, just over and over and over again. Clearly emotional, though, when her daughter's condition was brought up. And I tuck her in, and I put a hat on her because she was just, she was cold. Uh, it's about an hour and a half. I um, was waiting. I called my lawyer for thing. And I did not want her to be cold anymore. <laughs> and I gave her her polar bear. He rolled over to face me and he started punching me in the face. Fazari was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, and Welch was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years. Fazari's case has raised questions about the dangers of religious extremism. The sovereign citizen movement is a fringe group that believes that the government has no authority over its citizens. This belief can lead to people refusing to seek medical help for their children, which can have fatal consequences. Fuzari's case is a tragedy. Mary Welch was a young child who had her whole life ahead of her. She was slayed by her parents' religious beliefs, and her demise is a reminder of the dangers of extremism. In addition to the religious extremism aspect of the case, Fazari's case also raises questions about the role of women in religious cults. Fazari was a young, impressionable woman who was drawn into the sovereign citizen movement by her husband. Once she was in the movement, she was isolated from her family and friends, and she was subjected to her husband's control. This control extended to her decision-making about Mary's medical care. Number 15. Alexandria Thomas the case of Alexandria Thomas unfolded in a heart-wrenching manner during her hearing at the Palm Beach County Jail in Florida. Accused of fatally knifing her boyfriend outside a supermarket in Palm Beach, Alexandria faced grave charges that carried immense weight. However, the true magnitude of the situation struck her with full force when the judge revealed that her boyfriend was in a medically induced coma. The devastating news sent shockwaves through Alexandria's being and she succumbed to a flood of overwhelming emotions. The severity of the charges against her, coupled with the critical condition of her boyfriend, unleashed a wave of anguish that washed over her. The presence of her mother, who shared in her daughter's torment, stabbed in front of a building on East 10th Street in Alphabet City last night. <laughs> was stabbed in the back. Police took him into custody. He was taken to the hospital. Further heightened the emotional atmosphere in the courtroom. Both women were visibly distraught, their pain palpable. The emotional breakdown exhibited by Alexandria and her mother painted a poignant picture of the excruciating remorse and anguish they felt in that pivotal moment. It served as a powerful reminder of the profound consequences that unfolded from the tragic events surrounding the incident. The weight of their actions weighed heavily on their hearts, leaving an indelible mark on their lives. Number 14. Erica May Butts and Shanita Lewis Cunningham Erica May Butts and Shanita Lewis Cunningham, responsible for the slaying of a toddler named Serenity Richardson, received life sentences. When their sentences were read out in court, both convicts had emotional breakdowns, crying and screaming. Erica's mother also reacted intensely and had to be escorted out of the courtroom. The distressing scene culminated in both convicts being removed from the court in wheelchairs.
Number 13. Regina Johnson Regina Johnson, convicted of taking the lives of her husband and daughter, exhibited extreme anger during her sentencing. I shot him. Prosecutors argue Johnson struggled with severe paranoia and depression. When he put that gun down and I picked it up, I mean, I, I panicked and I was afraid and I thought I mean, that was his daughter too, but he killed her. San Marcos woman accused of executing her family. Regina Johnson fell apart talking about her 14-year-old daughter, Aaliyah. Despite her claims of acting in self-defense against her abusive boyfriend, the court found her guilty of both slayings. Her outburst in court involved writing accusatory messages on a mirror using red lipstick, blaming her husband. The 80-year sentence condemned Regina to spend the remainder of her life behind bars. Only three people know for sure what happened in the house that day, and two of them are dead. That Aaliyah, she was the love of my life. Johnson says she endured years of abuse and killed in self-defense. If I don't pick this gun up right now, he might try to kill me. And Johnson stayed in the house with the two bodies for three days. Number 12, Jody Herring. Jody Herring took the life of a social worker, Laura Sobel, who had removed Herring's daughter from her custody. Herring's act of revenge escalated further when she also slayed three of her relatives. In court, Herring cried and apologized for her actions, claiming she was sorry for the loss of life. However, Sobel's sister vehemently argued that Herring did not deserve any liberty. The judge agreed, sentencing Herring to life imprisonment, acknowledging the gravity of her crimes. Number 11. Sintoya Brown Sintoya Brown was a 16-year-old girl who was convicted of slaying and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole in 2004. Brown was a victim of trafficking, and she claimed that she shot Johnny Allen, the man she was convicted of slaying, in self-defense. Brown's case drew national attention, and she was eventually granted clemency by Tennessee Governor Bill Haslam in 2019. Brown was born in 1988 and raised in Nashville, Tennessee. Her mother was a drug addict and her father was absent from her life. Brown was physically attacked by her mother's boyfriend at a young age, and she ran away from home when she was 13 years old. Brown was homeless and turned to bodywork to survive. In 2004, Brown met Johnny Allen, a 43-year-old man who offered to pay her for physical favors. Brown went to Allen's house and she shot him to sleep. Brown claimed that she shot Allen in self-defense, and she said that she thought he was going to harm her. Brown was convicted of slaying and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Her case drew national attention, and many people believed that she had been unfairly convicted. Brown supporters argued that she was a victim of trafficking and that she should not have been held accountable for her actions. In 2019, Tennessee Governor Bill Haslam granted clemency to Brown. Haslam said that he believed that Brown had been rehabilitated and that she deserved a second chance. Brown was released from prison on August 7, 2019. Since her release from prison, Brown has become an advocate for criminal justice reform. She has spoken out about her experience as a victim of trafficking and about the need to change the way that the criminal justice system treats young people who are victims of attacks. Brown is also working to raise awareness about the issue of trafficking. Number 10. Tina Brown Tina Brown was born in 1961 in New York City. She was raised in a middle-class family and attended public schools. After high school, Brown attended the University of Pennsylvania, where she studied English literature. After graduating from college, Brown worked as a journalist for several years. In 1994, Brown was convicted of slaying the first degree. She was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Brown's case is notable because she was the first woman to be given capital punishment in the U.S. since the penalty was reinstated in 1976. Brown's sentence was later commuted to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Brown has maintained her innocence throughout her imprisonment. She has written several books about her experience, including The Tina Brown Story and The Tina Brown Diaries. Brown has also spoken out against the capital punishment and has campaigned for clemency. Brown's case has been the subject of much debate. Some people believe that Brown is guilty of slaying, while others believe that she is innocent. Brown's case is a reminder of the importance of due process and the dangers of the penalty. In 2019, Brown was granted clemency by President Donald Trump. She was released from prison after serving 25 years. 
Brown is now living in New York City and is working on a new book. Number 9. Lisa Montgomery Lisa Montgomery was born on February 27, 1968 in Malvern, Kansas. She was the second of four children born to Judy Shaughnessy and her first husband. Montgomery's mother was an alcoholic and her father was abusive. Montgomery was physically attacked by her stepfather and his friends from the age of 11. She also suffered from mental health problems, including depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. In 1986, Montgomery married her first husband, Carl Bowman. They had two children together. The marriage was abusive and Montgomery filed for divorce in 1996. In 1997, Montgomery married her second husband, Kevin Montgomery. They had two children together. On December 16, 2004, Montgomery drove to the home of Bobby Joe Stinnett, who was eight months pregnant. Montgomery strangled Stinnett to his demise and cut her unborn baby from her womb. Family statement, the family said that they will hope that their privacy will be respected. We will never forget the members of the law enforcement who found Bobby Joe's murder in less than 24 hours. Lisa Montgomery becomes just the third woman scheduled for execution in the federal system. The baby, a girl named Victoria Joe, survived and was returned to her father. Montgomery was arrested the next day and charged with kidnapping resulting in demise. She was convicted in 2007 and given capital punishment. Montgomery's ending was scheduled for January 13, 2021. However, her ending was delayed several times due to legal challenges. On January 13, 2021, Montgomery was executed by lethal injection at the Federal Correctional Complex in Terre Haute, Indiana. She was the first woman to be executed by the federal government in the U.S. since 1953. Montgomery's case has been controversial. Some people believe that she was mentally ill and should not have been executed. Others believe that she was a cold-blooded slayer who deserved to die. Number 8. Deborah Milkey Deborah Milkey was born in West Berlin, Germany in 1964. She moved to the U.S. with her family when she was 11 years old. Milkey married Mark Milkey in 1984 and they had one son, Christopher, in 1985. The couple divorced in 1988. On December 2, 1989, Christopher was taken to the mall to meet Santa Claus. He never came home. His body was found in the desert, shot three times in the back of the head. Milky was arrested and charged with slaying. She was convicted and given capital punishment. She was the youngest woman on row in the U.S. at the time. Milky maintained her innocence throughout her trial and appeal. She claimed that she was framed by her roommate, James Lynn Styers, and his friend, Roger Mark Scott. Styers and Scott were both convicted of slaying and given capital punishment. In 2013, the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals overturned Milky's conviction. The court found that Armando Saldate, the detective who interrogated Milky, had a history of misconduct and that his interrogation of Milky was coercive. Milky was released from prison in 2013. She has since spoken out about her wrongful conviction and the need to reform the criminal justice system. Milky's case is a reminder that the penalty is a flawed system that can lead to innocent people being executed. It is also a reminder that the criminal justice system is not always fair, especially for women and minorities. Number 7. Diana Downs Diane Downs was born in Phoenix, Arizona on August 7, 1955. She was the middle child of three children. Her parents were divorced when she was young and she lived with her mother and stepfather. Downs had a difficult childhood. She was often bullied and teased and she had a history of mental illness. In 1973, Downs married Steve Downs, a college student. The couple had three children together, Cheryl, Christy, and Danny. Downs was a stay-at-home mother, and she struggled to cope with the demands of raising three young children. She also had a strained relationship with her husband. On May 19, 1983, Downs drove her three children to a hospital in Springfield, Oregon. Cheryl was pronounced lifeless at the scene. Christy and Danny were both critically injured. Downs told police that she had been carjacked by a man who shot her children. However, there were several inconsistencies in her story and police soon began to suspect that she was the one who had shot her children. A medical examination of Downs revealed that she had not been carjacked. She had actually been shot in the arm and leg herself, but the wounds were self-inflicted. Downs also had a history of mental illness and she had been prescribed medication for depression and anxiety. At trial, Downs' defense team argued that she was insane at the time of the shootings. 
However, the jury found her guilty of slaying and attempted slaying. She was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Downs has continued to maintain her innocence throughout her imprisonment. She has written several books about her case, and she has appeared on several television shows. She has also filed several appeals, but all of them have been denied. The case of Diane Downs is one of the most famous cases of child attacks in American history. It has been the subject of books, movies, and television shows. Downs's case continues to fascinate people, and it raises questions about the nature of evil and the possibility of redemption. Here are some additional details about the case. Downs's husband, Steve, was a suspect in the case at first, but he was eventually cleared of any involvement. Downs's children, Christy and Danny, survived the shootings and have both gone on to live normal lives. Christy has written a book about her experience called My Story, A Journey of Hope. Downs has been denied parole several times, most recently in 2020. She is currently incarcerated at the Oregon State Penitentiary. Number 6. Susan Smith Susan Smith was born in Union, South Carolina on September 26, 1971. She was the youngest of four children. Her parents divorced when she was young, and she lived with her mother and stepfather. Smith had a difficult childhood. She was often bullied and teased, and she had a history of mental illness. In 1991, Smith married David Smith, a salesman. The case received national attention. Susan Smith and her then-husband David appeared on national news pleading for their boys' safe return. We say 25 years, JR, but to South Carolinians, it really doesn't feel like it was that long. From some, I can see from their side uh, why they have to do the things they have to do. The couple had two sons together, Michael, who was born in 1992, and Alexander, who was born in 1994. Smith was a stay-at-home mother, and she struggled to cope with the demands of raising two young children. She also had a strained relationship with her husband. On October 25, 1994, Smith reported to police that her vehicle had been carjacked by a black man who drove away with her sons still inside. For nine days, she made dramatic pleas on national television for their safe return. However, following an intensive investigation and a nationwide search for them, she confessed on November 3, 1994 to letting her car roll into nearby John D. Long Lake, drowning them inside. Her motivation was reportedly to facilitate a relationship with a local wealthy man named Tom Finley. Smith was arrested and charged with two counts of slaying. Got this mother who claims that her car was carjacked with her two small children inside. And myself both know the truth. I did not have anything to do with the abduction of my children. Immediately I said to the sled spokesman, come on, you gotta be kidding me. Well, nothing she said there was true. The boys were found in their mom's car inside John D. Long Lake. Called and asked for assistance, so we sent a team over and one of the first agents that went over was a forensic artist. She was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. She has maintained her innocence throughout her imprisonment. The case of Susan Smith is one of the most notorious cases of child attacks in American history. It has been the subject of books, movies, and television shows. Smith's case continues to fascinate people, and it raises questions about the nature of evil and the possibility of redemption. Here are some additional details about the case. Smith's husband David was devastated by the loss of his sons. He committed suicide in 1995. Smith's sons, Michael and Alexander, were buried together in a cemetery in Union, South Carolina. Smith has been denied parole several times. She is currently incarcerated at the Leith Correctional Institution in Greenwood, South Carolina. Number 5. Tina Marie Thompson Tina Marie Thompson's case dates back to 1995 when she was convicted of slaying and subsequently sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The significant aspect of her case is that she was accused of slaying her husband, a circumstance that added to the intrigue surrounding the trial. From the beginning, Tina Marie Thompson vehemently proclaimed her innocence and has continued to do so throughout her time behind bars. Her defense team argued that she was wrongly accused and pointed out several inconsistencies in the evidence and witness testimonies presented during the trial. During the investigation and subsequent trial, the prosecution argued that Thompson had a motive to slay her husband citing financial troubles and marital discord as potential factors. They presented circumstantial evidence, including phone records and financial records, attempting to link Thompson to the crime. Additionally, the prosecution relied on witness statements and forensic evidence to support their case. However, 
Thompson's defense team countered these claims, asserting that the evidence against her was insufficient to establish guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. They highlighted the lack of direct physical evidence tying Thompson to the crime scene and emphasized the possibility of alternative suspects. Perpetrates acts of violence against almost anyone he comes in contact. Print on her chest and her right hand was tied with evidently a piece of her shirt. Some similar inducement which would appeal to very young children. The pattern seems to be that while Number 3. Deborah Denise Brown Deborah Denise Brown was convicted of slaying in 1997 and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Brown's case is notable because she was accused of slaying her husband, who was a police officer. Brown has maintained her innocence throughout her imprisonment. Brown's husband, Thomas Brown, was found lifeless in their home in 1996. He had been shot multiple times. Brown was the only suspect in the case and she was arrested and charged with slaying. Brown's trial was highly publicized and the evidence against her was strong. The prosecution presented witnesses who testified that they had seen Brown arguing with her husband on the night of his demise. The prosecution also presented forensic evidence that linked Brown to the crime scene. Brown's defense team argued that she was innocent and that she had been framed. They pointed out that there were no eyewitnesses to the slaying and that the forensic evidence was circumstantial. They also argued that Brown had no motive to slay her husband. The jury found Brown guilty of slaying, and she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Brown has maintained her innocence throughout her imprisonment as she has filed several appeals. Brown's case has been the subject of much controversy. Some people believe that she is innocent, while others believe she is guilty. There is no clear consensus on Brown's guilt or innocence, and her case remains a mystery. In 2019, Brown's case was featured on the Netflix documentary series The Innocence Files. The series explored the evidence in Brown's case and raised questions about her guilt. The series also highlighted the challenges that Brown and other inmates face in proving their innocence after being convicted of a crime. Number 2. Karen Ann Tolles Karen Ann Tolles is an individual who gained attention due to her conviction for slaying in 1998. She was found guilty of slaying her husband and subsequently received a life sentence in prison without the possibility of parole. Tolles' case has garnered interest and discussion because she has consistently maintained her innocence throughout her time in prison. The details surrounding the case indicate that Tolles was accused of slaying her husband, although the specific circumstances leading to his demise may vary depending on the sources consulted. Tolles' conviction implies that the court found her guilty beyond a reasonable doubt leading to the severe sentence of life imprisonment. Tolles' steadfast assertion of her innocence has been a significant aspect of her case. Despite being convicted, she has consistently maintained that she did not commit the crime for which she was found guilty. This stance has likely prompted ongoing public interest and debate regarding the fairness of her conviction. Number 1. Linda Sue White Linda Sue White was convicted of slaying in 1999 and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. White's case is notable because she was accused of slaying her husband, John White. White has maintained her innocence throughout her imprisonment. The prosecution's case against White was based on circumstantial evidence. The most damning piece of evidence was a bloody fingerprint found at the scene of the crime. However, White's lawyers argued that the fingerprint could have been planted by the police. They also pointed out that there was no eyewitness testimony to the slaying. The jury found White guilty after a short deliberation. She was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. White has maintained her innocence ever since. She has filed several appeals, but all of them have been denied. White's case has been the subject of much controversy. Some people believe that she is innocent and that she was framed by the police. Others believe that she is guilty and that she is getting what she deserves. In 2017, a new documentary called The Case of Linda Sue White was released. The documentary explores the evidence in White's case and raises questions about her guilt. The documentary has helped to raise awareness of White's case and has led to calls for her release. White is currently 76 years old and is still incarcerated she continues to maintain her innocence and is hopeful that she will one day be exonerated.
That's all for this video, folks. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you next time.